Let's start my talk. Uh, I'm going to talk about hidden gems in Ertulan. Uh, this, will, this talk will be about uh, showing some interesting things that are implemented in Rudder 2, but very few people use it or know it. And it can be sometimes funny, sometimes useful, sometimes interesting. So I hope that this talk entertains you a little bit. So Rudder 2 is a very big, pretty big project. There are a lot of functionalities and features and comments and little tricks that few of us know. And what makes learning rather too is that it's fun. I mean, you never uh, stop learning new things and you find new ways for doing things. So it's, it's always a, a continuous learning, which is kind of fun mainly because some of these functionalities are implemented as uh, Easter eggs or some funny uh, common names and things like that. So in this talk, I will try to present you some of these little tricks. The first one is the hood. Uh, some of you that you attend the trainings will probably know about this. The hood is, can you see that? <laughs> okay, that size is good. So the hood mode can be entered by pressing B and then lower dash or just pre uh, entering visual mode and then pressing lower dash. So when you do this, uh, the hood mode allows you to autocomplete uh, from a list of uh, strings. So in this case, for example, it's all the strings from slash bin slash ls program. So we can filter, for example, for sim and then uh, maybe print. So we can use the space for s splitting uh, by different words that ma must match on each of the, of the rows. And then we can use the arrows for going up and down. And when we want to seek to a specific symbol, just press enter and we'll go there. The good thing of the hood is that it's not only listing symbols, it's also listing strings, listing methods of classes, listing comments. So if you have a comment placed in a specific place, you can just uh, type whatever it's, it's going there. Like uh, maybe I go there and, and I put a comment in here. It's here in the at right. So I can use this for seeking to this address. Another way for using the hood is using the grep operator. So you have like a long listing like this, and you want to use the internal grep and then typing three dots. The two dots is for less. So if you type this, you can scroll up and down. So it's the internal less implementation of Rudder 2. But if you do the same thing with uh, the third dot, you will get into the hood. The hood will basically take all the lines from the output of the comment and allows you to autocomplete them. So you can do, for example, call, and you will get only the calls from the list, or mob, or any other register name, or anything that matches in the line. Uh, the next interesting thing is that analysis. Most of people, when they analyze a binary, they basically run AAAA, and the more A's that you add, uh, the better analysis you expect to get. But this is not true. <laughs> Uh, so the thing is that not all the binaries can be analyzed in the same way. Uh, not all the architectures need the same ways for analyzing the, the code, mainly because they have the, some restrictions or some changes depending on the alignment of memory, the kind of instructions that you find, if there are some uh, anti the disassembly protections or, uh, or the code it's, uh, of the code is obfuscated. You will probably need other comments for analyzing the code. So it's so interesting to understand how these comments work um, and how to use them, mainly because uh, not, there is no need for analyzing the whole binary, using a seal, using, uh, finding all the references, and so on, mainly because this is a slow. The reason why it's the slow is because it's doing many passes for the same code and doing, using different algorithms for taking information from the code. Um, so here's the list of some of the most interesting comments that few people use. AAB is a comment that was implemented by the Fragger. Uh, it's, a, it's an algorithm that is basically walking for all the executable sections of the binary, looking for calls. And when they find a, a, a call, it will identify that the destination of a call is uh, the beginning of a function. So having this information, it will start splitting all the basic blocks. And when there is the whole uh, list of basic blocks identified, it will try to remove all the false positives. And then you get the, all the full program graph uh, and all the, all the functions graph out of this. 
the good thing of this method is that it's very reliable, uh, it's very fast, uh, and it works pretty well. Um, it will probably be the default analysis in following versions, but for now we are not using it yet. Uh, the other common is AAB. Um, the B is for variables uh, or values. And this is used for looking for values that are pointing in, in the text section that are pointing to a text section. So for example, if you, if you have a MIPS binary that they, or a bootloader that they have like uh, some D words or keywords hard coded inside the, the program memory, um, this, uh, this comment will basically look for um, alignment values with a value that points inside one of the regions that are executable. And if it matches, it will add an, uh, a reference. So you will see, uh, after running this command, all the hard-coded pointers inside the program memory. Another command is the AAR. The AAR is for looking for references. What it's doing is the same, uh, looking for uh, references in the all executable sections of lo loaded in, in as maps. And when you do, you do this, you will basically get all the cross references for strings, for code, functions, etc. And the last one that I'm gonna show here, th there are so many more comments, not just this, is the AAE. The AAE comment is uh, a comment that will run the same thing, so analyzing all the executable code, but on using emulation. That, co that function will do linear emulation, and if you have, for example, a, a, a call that is using a resistor instead of a, a hard-coded um, destination, uh, value, uh, it will basically emulate the code and look for the register value at this point. So this is useful sometimes. For other times, you will probably get uh, a pointer to a jump table or something like that. So the destination for a register is usually not only one, so there will be more than one. So you probably need to use uh, more than uh, one analysis to identify this. There are several analysis options. Uh, if you check into this common, if you type a dot anal dot, you will get the list of all the variables that can modify the analysis loop. You can press two question marks and you will get the help for all these variables. And well, some of the most interesting ones are this. The has next option uh, forces the analysis to find a function after the end of another function. So it assumes that after one function, there will be a bunch of knobs, a bunch of traps, and then the beginning of another function. Uh, the AQF, uh, it's another analysis loop. It was written from scratch, and it's much more clean and easy to uh, modify and, and, and read. Uh, so it's not the default one, but you can enable this, and you will uh, use this loop analysis loop from uh, any other analysis common. It's also possible to implement analysis uh, plugins, so you can write your own analysis loop in a separate plugin or just a, in a script that you run from any scripting language. The jump table option basically identify all the register jumps. So if there is a jump that points to a register, it will analyze the previous instruction and look for the boundaries for the jump table. So jump tables usually they are. Uh, we can. I can make. I will make a show. Uh, we'll show a demo here. Jam tables usually have um, a list of delta pointers hard coded inside program memory. So AAB will not find anything because it's a negative value, what you will see here. Uh, if you go into the X, you will see that there is a table like this in here. You can see that there are a lot of negative values here, like filled by F. And we can use this for looking for the uh, integer values of these words. So if we go into the entry point and we see that the code is not analyzed, we have enabled the jump table option and we run AF, the analyzing this function. It will look for all the jump tables and he, it has identified uh, three jump tables in this function. So we can go into the first one. And we see that here is, uh, so the jump table is basically referenced and loaded into register. And then at the end, it's calling a register for uh, jumping to the delta destination that it's pointed in, in there. So we can seek into the jump table flag. And we will see that here is, uh, here is the list of all the cases for this jump table. 
and uh, it translates the disassembly of this address because it's not really a disassembly, it's just uh, numeric values uh, that are using uh, useless deltas. And we have all the X refs. We can press X and we will see all the references that are following this jump table cases. So we can see all the, ca uh, the code that is implementing each uh, case for the switch. Uh, as you can see, there are also flags for all the cases. So there is a flag for uh, case 57, uh, etc. And so on. And the final option that it's pretty handy is the uh, strings option. When you enable the strings op option, it will disable the bin.strings uh, configuration option. Um, what bin strings do is that when you load the binary at the at start, it will look for all the data sections, all the sections in the binary that they used to have uh, strings or text, um, uh, uh, printable text, and it will look for strings in, in, in this section. So if you enable annual strings, it will disable the bin strings and you will get no strings at a loading time. But when you do analysis, it will basically start looking for references when doing uh, the code analysis. So we, you will only get the strings that are referenced by code. So you, uh, you will see no strings until you analyze and then you will see all the strings referenced from which part of code are they used. So. Uh, there is also several visual uh, uh, modes. Uh, we have seen the visual mode in here, uh, that it's just pressing B. But if we press the exclamation mark, we will go into the uh, visual pan panels. Uh, the visual panels mode is similar to DWM. Uh, it's a tilted window manager that it's pretty simple uh, and, and it aims to be uh, handy for uh, people who is using the keyboard or uh, tilted window managers. There is a menu on top that you can choose different options or comments. And you can uh, change the layout for everything, add new panes in here. Each of these panes is basically rendering the output of a comment. So you can type the comment that you want to be re rendered there and then you get the, the, uh, the window in there. And every time that you make an operation like stepping or like you are debugging here, you can do all the uh, options here. Uh, it will update all the, pan all the panels, so you will get the uh, contents of the stack, all the backtrace, or the register values, etc. Uh, this is handy when you have like a smaller font text or, <laughs> or bigger screens. So you can change the pane that you want to focus and, and so on. Uh, you can change with tab and then uh, shift tab for going backward. There is also help. So apart from that, there is also uh, this famous game. I don't know if you ever played it, but it's quite addictive. <laughs> And um, when I was playing this game like two or three years ago, uh, I, I was playing almost <laughs> all the day, and um, I decided to implement it in C. So uh, it was 300 lines of code or something like that. Uh, so I decided to put it as, a, um, as an Easter egg inside Rotor 2. And um, at the end, when somebody finds the Easter egg, I remove it and put it somewhere else, or, uh, and then I add another hidden Easter egg. So uh, when you can find the game in this menu, you play with this H, J, K, L letters. And then you have the X representation for the values. And it's basically exactly the same in game, but using the, the keyboard. There is some legend or people saying that once we ordered some pizzas using Rudder 2, uh, that's true. In a private congress that we organized several years ago, we had uh, like, it was 30 people or something like that. So we had to or ask for so many uh, different kind of pizzas. So I basically uh, added a comment in Rudder 2 to show all the, um, uh, the size of each flag in, uh, with progress bars. And I was basically typing uh, comments in order to uh, increase the value of a, of a flag or decrease it depending on how many people was asking for a specific uh, pizza. So this is the way that you can order pizzas for that. <laughs> Easter eggs. There have been a bunch of uh, Easter eggs in the other two. Uh, I, as I said before, I remove them as soon as somebody uh, identifies them. So, uh, and then I, 
put a, another one in a different place. Uh, I used to, he to hide them in, in the commit message, so th there is no clear message that adding a new Easter egg, so you have to find a little bit. <laughs> um, so anybody knows which is the current Easter egg, which is in master branch? No? Then you have something to do now. <laughs> This is another option that I added uh, last week. Uh, it's the screen.rainbow. Uh, the rainbow mode basically changes the color of the offset depending on the value of this offset. Uh, this creates a rainbow effect that allows you to remember a, a, an address without having to remember the numbers. Because usually when, when you are working on 64-bit uh, or something which is not just an embedded device that the memory can be memorized easily, uh, you usually need some help, like adding flags or uh, changing the background color of the area or something like that. So I had the idea of adding this rainbow mode, uh, which is basically uh, changing the color depending on the offset. So you can uh, remember that this function is green or there was a, a, a jump table that was in the red zone, etc. Let me show you that. I'm just scrolling down and the color is changing. So that's it. Another thing is that you can change the colors of the everything. Uh, and there is also a theme editor, uh, which is implemented inside the visual mode. To change the color, uh, you can use the echo command. The echo command is basically listing all the, all the themes that are registered inside Rather2. So you can use, for example, the Rasta mode. Well, let's stick to the entry point. So here is the Rasta mode. Uh, there are other modes like uh, the gray is quite nice. It depends a little bit on your consonant. is also quite interesting. And the thing is that if you want to edit any of these uh, themes, you can press in visual mode uppercase E, and then you can up and down to change which kind of option you want to change. And then you have RGB keys for increasing or decreasing the red, green, or blue colors. So let's change the colors of the function name, for example, and I will start here. And I will change the color of the function name. So I can increase the red color and decrease the blue. And we get the, this color. We can increase the green and reduce the red, etc. Then all these uh, options are recorded in, into the AC command, so you can pipe this into a file and then add it uh, in your start script for choosing the, the color scan that you want. There is also a bit editor. Uh, a bit editor allows you to change the values of a word or a keyword uh, by byte, uh, every bit of, the, of this. To do that, uh, I will enable the um, uh, catch in order to, because I didn't open the file as read-write, so I don't, and I don't want to modify ls. So I am enabling this, and all the changes that I will be, uh, I will be doing here will be in memory. So if I go into visual mode and then press D for defining, I can see that there are a bunch of options there, and one of them is the edit bit. So I edit the, press the one, and I see this editor. I can use the arrow keys or IGAK. For moving around, I can increase and decrease the, the value of the bit. So there are only two values. And you can see that it's printing the character. Uh, well, for now, it's only limited to two, but it will be probably incremented to, uh, to three values at some point uh, when we support quantum computers. Uh, so you can, you can see that there is the instruction that is disassembled there. So it's pretty handy for uh, seeing which instructions are created or which bits you have to change in order to get a, a specific instruction defined by the disassembler. Then you also see the SL expression that is uh, implementing this instruction. Uh, you can also see the character in ASCII table that is uh, represented by these bits. Also the decimal number and hexadecimal and et cetera. So it's pretty handy for analyzing uh, bit fields or stuff like that. And yeah, we also have Clippy. The Clippy can be accessed using the question mark and uppercase E. And then you can type a message here, like uh, hello world. You can also use this with other comments, like for example, we have fo comment that allows you to print the fortune message that it's shown at the beginning. So you can mix those two comments and get 
Clippy saying, giving you some <laughs> messages. And that's it. At some point, we will have like a full uh, reverse engineering assistant implemented in, on top of Clippy. But for now, it's just <laughs> printing messages like in a, a fancy way. Uh, there are also a bunch, of, a bunch of different visual browsers. So if you go into visual mode, there are some keys that allows you to walk into the list of classes, list of methods, uh, flag spaces, types, strokes, loaded, enums, etc. Uh, so let's keep in this uh, b slash bin slash s session. So if you go into visual mode and you will press the uh, uppercase F, we will see that we can list all the flag spaces. Um, flags are basically a name for an offset. So it's a way for bookmarking places inside the binary. Uh, but they are grouped by, uh, by uh, in group flag spaces. So you can have, for example, uh, flags that are inside the group of strings or flags that are in the group of symbols, etc. And you can also add and remove any of these flag spaces. So you can move around and we can choose, for example, the symbols. And we can get the list of all the symbols that are there. We can press P for changing the print mode. If you want to see, like, for example, the, the location of these strings or the hexadecimal printing or the disassembly. So we can see uh, each of these uh, symbols uh, where it's pointing to. We can also go back and change to a different flag space, etc. And again, as everything in Radar 2 is self-documented. So if you press the question mark, you will get help message from there. And it will explain you how to, which other keys you have for doing stuff in, in this. So you can rename flags. You can change the value of a flag. You can remove a flag space, etc. And you can also, of course, use the hood mode with this. The same goes for types, strokes, which is the T. So if we go back and we press uppercase T, no, we changed that. <laughs> uh, lowercase t. And the lowercase t, you have the list of all the types that are loaded. This is basic types like uh, integer, character, uh, unsigned integer, 64 bit values, etc. And this is a printing format. So the PF is a comment that allows you to print a formatted string. So you can uh, do things like uh, this. Well, let's have some values. We can print something like that, which is two hexadecimal values and one integer. And then we can put names for, for this, like, uh, and we get the, like a structure way. We can also use this for printing arrays of strokes and other things like that. OK, so going back there, we can uh, press right key for going to the right. And then we have the list of enums, the list of strokes, functions, and unions. The functions are basically uh, functions from libc that are loaded into Radar 2. And these ones are used for taking the signature and res resolve the arguments and the return value when you are doing a code analysis. And the same goes for classes. Uh, and you can see the methods and so on. Another thing uh, which is actually, uh, there is more people using it, so I guess that most of you already know about this. It's the package manager that comes inside Roller 2. Uh, R2PM, it's a program, it's a, right now it's a shell script, but at some point it will be a, a program written in C or in Rust. And it's uh, containing and uh, maintaining a database of packages that are usually used by Roller 2 or by Roller 2 users. So let's see how this works. If we press R2PM, we get the help. And if we add minus S at the end, we'll see the list of all the packages that are there. Uh, the reason for this is because you are searching for a keyword. But if you don't specify the keyword, you get the list of all the packages. So we can see here that there is uh, all the R2PI uh, bindings in here. Uh, there is also R2 APIs for if you want to use APIs from, from there, the lang. Etc. But there are also other things that are not just plugins for other two. There are packages like Keystone, the Keystone library. There is also Diaphora, Dirtico Exploit, um, Android. There is a A3A, which is another full overwrite of the code analysis. This one is, is the same of AAB, also written by the Fragger, uh, and it's implemented in Rust. It's a plugin written in Rust that runs inside Roller 2 and allows to analyze code. And it's a little bit faster than this implementation thing. So here you can see all the packages. There is even Balgreen, uh, Balabind, ACR, Yara, all the most packages. And well, writing packages for Roller 2 PM 
it's pretty easy. You just need to check the DB directory and you can see that there are a file for each package. So you see that there is a definition of the package. Uh, it starts with begin, ends with n, and then there are two functions. Uh, one implements the installing step and then the uninstall step. By default, it will be installing everything in your home, so you don't have to be careful about your system directory because uh, it will do everything without root. But if you add the minus, minus g, it will install globally. It's similar to how npm works. So you can use R2PM uh, in local uh, for installing, R2, uh, you can even install router 2 using R2PM, so you can uh, upgrade and, and install router 2 using R2PM, so it's like uh, self-referenced. And you can do that at your home without having to mess with the rest of the users. Another comment that I added uh, one month ago or something like that is to, for printing uh, QR codes. The QR codes are generated from the contents in the current block. So if we do this, we can press PQ10, and we'll see the 10 bytes uh, represented as a uh, QR code. Um, the QR can be as big as, uh, as you want, uh, so you can specify like a large amount, but uh, not all applications support like very big uh, QR codes. Some of them crash, some of them just don't read it. And the funny thing is that you can use anything in there. So you can do binary QR codes, not just printable text or URLs or things like that, or, or even put a picture in there. Uh, one of the things that you might notice in here is that the QR code is inverted. This is another thing that some QR readers don't, don't handle properly. Uh, so you can change the color scheme of the terminal to have the like the black, the white background and the black uh, front, front foreground. Uh, but it's also it will be also implemented at some point uh, to have an option to do that using uh, ANSI codes. Another thing which is fully used is that uh, you can implement aliases and macros. An alias is basically an alias uh, name for a, a, a common or a list of comments. So you have a, this is probably a bad example because the comment that you are trying to alias is shorter than the alias name. <laughs> so it's not that useful, but it's just an example. So you can uh, put a comma separated comments and you will only type foo for running this, this alias. There is another thing which is called macros, uh, which is an, like an alias, but allows you to specify arguments for this. Uh, and you can implement them like this, so just use, uh, using a parenthesis to uh, specify the scope of the, of the macro. And then you put the name of the macro, the space separated argument names of, the, of this macro, and then comma separated list of uh, comments. So you can uh, use dollar zero, dollar one, dollar two for accessing the values passed to the macro, and you can reference register names, flags, uh, put any comment in there. This is handy if you want to have like uh, three, four comments, like disassemble step, and, and analyze some code or dump uh, an X dump from a specific area of memory. And you, instead of having, typing three, five comments every time, you you can just write a macro for that. Another way for doing that is uh, implementing uh, all this stuff in a script, in a separate script that you can interpret using the dot common. Uh, this is done with a, like this. <coughs> so, you can see that here's the contents of the script. So if I do dot space and then the name of the script, it will load this script. Uh, right now, it's loading as comments of router 2, but if you do the same uh, in Python, for example, it will also work, mainly because it will take the extension of the file and it, uh, run it if it's known. I mean, if it's not JS, if it's Python, if it's Perl, if it's Ruby, etc. So um, the other thing is that when you run this, it will run with the R2Pipe uh, environment ready for working, so you can use R2Pipe from inside this script, not just Python script. Another good thing is that you can also uh, make a script that is printing some comments to the standard output, and you can interpret the output of these comments just by prefixing with a dot. Another handy thing that few people know is that uh, there is, I mean, everybody knows that 
there is the add sign for specifying, specifying a, a temporal offset. So we can print this or we can print this at current offset plus uh, one byte. So we decide the second instruction. Uh, we can put any kind of uh, mathematical expression in, in there. But if you use question mark at question mark, you get the help for the, the, for the add sign. And in the add sign, you will see that there are a bunch of modifiers, which are these ones. Though. So you can use this for uh, changing some eval variables in a temporal way. You can also specify that you want to disassemble the third or fourth instruction or uh, just read a specific place, from, but using a, a different file descriptor if you have different files loaded, files loaded in the same address. Uh, but then you have the for each iterators. The for each iterators are implemented by uh, two or three uh, add signs. This is used, for example, if you want to print the uh, a list of values, we can use this. The way this works is by, uh, so question mark B will show the value of the argument. So you can use B for testing mathematical expressions. And the other thing is that if you type dollar dollar, it will print the current offset. So if you make an iteration over a list of space separated offsets, it will show the values it's because it's the, the current offset that is uh, happening there. Uh, obviously, you can do that with uh, another comment, which is uh, showing more hand information. And if you have, like, for example, a uh, trace or something like that, you can just pass the list of all the traces points and get the the correct disassembly in there. So this is just an example of printing through random instructions. Uh, other handy subcommands that are in here is that you can iterate over all the functions, over all the basic blocks of a function, over all the the um, the offsets specified inside the file. So you can have like a text file with one offset in each line. And it will do the same like in this, but instead of specifying all of them in the command line, you can have a file with all them. You can also run the command in all the threads. So if you are automatizing some kind of debugging session, you can run a command in all the threads, like stepping one instruction in all the threads. Uh, here you see all the instructions for the current function, etc. And then there is the three uh, add signs. And this is used for higher level concepts like symbols, imports, registers, threads, comments, etc. Uh, this is also handy because you can have, for example, like an iteration for printing a bunch of comments on all the register values. So, uh, and you can then specify, for example, in all the all comments. So if you have some kind of a specific comments in with a, a comment, like a specific, a specific keyword that you want to, to use for understanding which part of the code you are analyzing, you can run a comment in all these places. And here are some examples. One of them is the, <coughs> we are, uh, well, the first one will show uh, the analysis in JSON format for all the instructions in the current function. So if we type this, we will see the, the a JSON object uh, showing the information for the current instruction. And we can use add, add i in order to get the same thing for all the instructions in the current function. So we analyze this, and then we do that. You will get this output. We can also get the, the compilation, self the compilation uh, on all the functions. And this is another handy uh, subcommon that allows you to iterate over all the hit results for a search. So if you want to replace all the 80 numbers for, with a 91, you can just write hexadecimal 90, which is an expert, not a, an hexadecimal number. And then you say add add in order to iterate over all the search. So you have all the search subcomments available in there. So you can use all of these. And what you want to do is search for all the values that are uh, matching the, the argument, which is 8, 0. Uh, this will replace all the activities by, uh, with 90. Another thing that I have already shown is that there is some embedded uh, support for indenting and processing JSON doc objects. And this is done using the, the internal grep operator. So if you do I, for example, then you can append the J key 
most of the error to comments uh, output in JSON format if you append the J key. So you get the, uh, the output like this. And you type the character for So you type the, the internal grep, and then you can open and, and close the brace. And here you get the indentation with some kind of colors. But the thing is that you can also use the, some kind of query in order to get the value, a specific value inside this object. So in this case, we will like to get the file name, and we can do, do it like this. which is basically following the path inside the, the, the JSON document. You can also do that with an array. So if there is like an array of objects, you can iterate or get all the offset values inside the, all the objects in the array, etc. It's not as powerful as JQ, but uh, it's improving over time. Uh, another thing that I explained before but didn't show any example is that you can interpret the output of a comment or a script as our two comments. We can do that. Uh, we can change the So we are writing a Python script which is printing a comment of router two. We can test this like this. And if we want to run this script, we can just do it like that. So we basically, uh, we are telling router 2 that we want to quit after interpreting this file. Uh, and with two dashes, I'm saying that I don't, I don't want to open any file. So if you press one dash, it will open a malloc for testing things and writing stuff. But if you type two, it will not open anything because I don't really need anything. So that will ruin the output of this comment. But if I want to interpret this, I can or pipe this into a file and then interpret it, or just prefix it with another dot. Yep. Demo effect. <laughs> no, like this. Another sub comment which is pretty handy when you're analyzing ARM binaries is the AH, which is for anal hints. The hints are useful for uh, changing some specific options in different instructions. So it's hinting the analysis uh, loop in order to specify that this instruction is thumb or it's uh, uh, ARM32, for example. Or you can also use that for changing the values of the uh, arguments in an uh, instruction. So we can change the immediate value in a number, like this. We can just press enter in cursor mode, and here we can change the, the We can see all the options that we have here, and one of, uh, the one that I will use here is changing the immediate. Uh, we can specify that we want to use 1, 8, 10, 16 or s. s is for a string. So if you have an instruction that is building a string just using the immediate that is passed an argument, you can do that for uh, changing that uh, numeric argument as a, uh, to a string. So you will get like a quoted string with the uh, characters. So in this place we have uh, uh, this number and what I will do is change this to base 10. So you will see that something like that. Uh, I can try that but this is useless but you will see uh, how it shows. And there is also other options, like changing the value for octal, etc. As you can see, there are other options, like changing the bits for this specific instruction. It's also possible to overwrite the call destination or the jam destination for a, if you have, for example, a call to register, you can force that this register is a known value and you can make the analysis work like this. It's also possible to change the seal expression that is uh, used when emulating code. So uh, you don't have to change the plugin or the implementation in C that is uh, exposing the seal ex expression to the R2 engine. Uh, you can just change it using that. 
and so on. You can even change the, so if you have this, you can also change the text representation of the, this assembly. Another handy thing is the syscall database. Uh, inside Rado2, there is a, a library which is called syscall and stores a list of all the name of, sim, uh, of syscall, the number, and the signature. So this is the number of arguments that is uh, uh, accepting, the type, the type of these arguments, etc. Um, the thing is that you can, you have, well, we have the, this database for different operating systems and different architectures, mainly because it's, I mean, there, it's not the same syscall table for PowerPC Linux than uh, uh, x86 Linux. Uh, so some of them are sharing them, but uh, most of the cases they are having diff different Cisco tables, and also they are using different registers. So it's also handy to, to have this database for each uh, pair of operating system architecture. And we can query this in the two directions. So you can, you can ask Rather2 to get uh, which is the name for a specific Cisco um, um, number or which is the Cisco number for a specific Cisco name. We have this sub -comments. so we have like, for example, AS write. And this will uh, take the current arguments with the current state of registers and show you uh, that, uh, like if you are calling this syscall. You can also specify a number. It's like, well, in this case, it's not, because, uh, So you can see that you can also specify all these kind of things and you can dump the whole database like this. All these syscall databases are implemented uh, as text files. And this is the format. So it's just the name, then the value for the syscall, it's 80, the syscall number 80, etc. And then there is the value and the, and the string which is representing the signature. So it's integer, pointer, integer, or zero terminator string, hexadecimal values, etc. Okay, everybody has seen that Rather2 is able to uh, render a function as graph. But it's also possible to create your own graph. So there is the AG subcommons that allows you to create nodes, create edges, and put contents inside nodes. And you can do that to create your own graphs for everything. So you, you can use, for example, uh, you can write a script, which is using a pipe to analyze a program or getting some information from different places. And then you can execute these comments from this script in order to create a, a nasty art graph. Um, the graph representation is internal, so it's not just this RCR graph. So you can output this graph in graph base mode or JSON or key value output format, etc. So let's make an example here. Uh, you can create a new node. You, you have the script in here. And then we can create edges from foo to bar and another edge from foo to go. So we can press AGG. Then we can add another node here, like AGN, la la, and then we can add an edge from Co to la la. And we can see stuff like that. So this is handy because you don't have to use C code for reusing or creating your own graphs. And this graph is rendered using all the graph uh, options. So you can change the course cam, you can also change the layout, uh, et cetera. Another handy thing is that there are opcode descriptions. So if you're trying to analyze a binary who is in a, an architecture that you don't really know or you are not really uh, experienced on that, you can enable the option. Uh, this option is asm.describe. So if you go into visual mode, you will see that at right, there is a bunch of comments that are displaying the description for each instruction. Uh, the funny thing of this is that uh, it's pretty easy to extend that. So you can just go into the ASMD directory and you have like 
uh, text file for each architecture. So you have the instruction name and then the description. Nothing more. I mean, just one key value for describing these kind of uh, help messages. Another handy thing is the telescoping. Telescoping is handy because uh, when you're analyzing stack or resistors, uh, you usually want to understand if the contents in the stack are pointers or are values or if it's a string, etc. Uh, so there is the DRR comment and the PXR comment. The DRR works for resistors and the PXR works for memory. So if we do that in here, we'll see that there is nothing useful because it's basically only showing that here in this address there is a program counter, but I'm not, an, I'm not debugging right now. I'm just opening the file in plain text. So if, if I open, oh, I have the build. <laughs> it's half patched. So uh, I will. I will build uh, another, and when it's finished, it will continue the demo. Another thing that you can do is emulation. Uh, you can do emulation for uh, different parts, and there are many comments in Router 2 that allows you to emulate code uh, without having to uh, modify memory or anything like that, because it's catching all the contents of that. And many of the comments that are implemented in the debugger are also implemented in, in the, the uh, emulator. So you can use, for example, the ASU comment to emulate until specific instructions. So it will do a stepping, changing the values of resistors and so on, but it will stop at specific offset. It's like setting a breakpoint, continuing on setting the breakpoint, but it's much more handy. Um, there is th the same thing goes into the debugger. So if you use the DCU comment, it will continue until specific address. And another thing which is pretty handy is the asm.emo string, which will only catch the string references using emulation. Uh, let me show you an example. Okay, so now we have the debugger. And here we have the resistors, the stack, etc. If we use the PXR at RSP, we'll see the telescoping of the contents in the stack. So the color means the if it's executable, if it's green, if it's data, it's in red. If not, it's a value, like a unknown number. And then it tries to follow the pointer like two or three times. Um, so in here we have like the, here is the RSP. And we, uh, it's identifying that this is the address where the LS binary is mapped in memory. And it also says that it's a section which is in read and executable uh, permissions, and it shows which instruction is in this address. Also, then we have other things, like for example, here we have a pointer of data, which is pointing to a string, which is in read-write mode, and this string is the slash bin slash less. We can, as you can see, that there is some more text in there. We can also continue until the main or the entry point of the binary, and we can also see that the stack has changed, so we can see the contents that are different here. And we can also do the same with registers, pressing the RR, and we, it will be telescoping all the values of all the registers. So let's go into the ASM emulation. So it, we enable this string with option. We can see that it's uh, showing at the right side uh, the new value of the resistor after, after executing it. So we have like the push RSP, RBP. Uh, the only resistor that is modified is RSP. So it shows that RSP will have this value after running this instruction. And the funny thing is that we can see that uh, there are some string references or pointers that are resolved for resistors. So if we go down and we find the jump to a resistor, we will see. Uh, we can see the value of R RCX in this address, and we can also enable emu string, which will only show the strings that are uh, showing in this place by using emulation. This is pretty handy when you are analyzing uh, object C applications, when you because you have you need uh, the register contents to know the name of the class or the method that you are going to call because everything is going to a proxy call to object C message sent. 
Another thing is that there is tracing. Uh, Francesco already shown some demos in the r 2 Frida talk. But you can enable ASM trace and DB trace in order to uh, debug, uh, enable the traces when you're debugging or uh, show them in the disassembly when, when you want printing the, that. So we enable the uh, tracing. We can enable the tracing in the uh, disassembly. And we go into visual mode. And we see that there are these numbers in here. And we go into the program counter and we start stepping. We'll see that there is a number which is incrementing. The first number means uh, the number of times that this instruction has been executed, and the second one means uh, the order of it. So uh, we'll see when you go into a loop, hopefully soon. So here is a loop, and you can see that you're stepping and how many times this loop has been executed. You can also print uh, the whole trace uh, like in a linear way, and you get like a linear disassembly of all the whole execution. You can also append the register state for each uh, trace, etc. It's also <coughs> possible to script using native languages. It's not just a, a, a monopoly, uh, monopoly of the dynamic languages to, to be used as a scripting languages. Uh, so you can use C, you can use Vala, uh, you can use Roost, etc. But uh, probably these two languages are probably more, more handy. The way that this thing is done is because the, when you use the Hashbang um, C, it will use the C compiler to build the code that you are typing, generate a shared library, load it into Radar2, and it will resolve, be able to use all the symbols that are uh, loaded inside Radar2. So you can use all the C API of Radar2. Uh, the good thing of using Bala is that you can do the same, but you have some checks because you have some BAPI which are describing the APIs and how to use them. So it's harder to, to make mistakes when you are typing these kind of things. Also, um, when you are scripting like this, you need uh, an instance. I mean, you need a way to communicate with, uh, I mean, you don't want to run a printf in C. You want to do something more handy. And this is done like this. So when you are uh, writing the, the script, you can, this is in Bala, for example, you can type using Radar to import all the APIs of Radar2 in, in, into Bala. And then you, can, you have to define the entry point and you get the core instance. So this is the instance of Radar2 that will be uh, uh, allowing you to access all the information of the current session. Uh, and this is an object, and this object has methods. So you can type core.cmd in order to run a command, or you can have core.bin to access all the binary uh, library and all the methods for analyzing the, or getting information from the binary. You can also use the disassembler inside, etc. It's, it's everything like if you do it statically, but you are doing, doing it like in a runtime, because it's building and running the script uh, in line inside Rudder 2 by loading the shared library. And after that, it will unload the library. The problem with that is that if you make a mistake or you pass the different or invalid arguments, it will probably crash. And if it's crashing, uh, you will probably um, need a way for handling this uh, sick fault in, in the host site. So another funny thing is that uh, there is R2 preload, which is a way for preloading Rather2 inside any process. Uh, Francesco has shown how to do that using Frida. Uh, so you can use R2 Frida to inject um, uh, R2 inside any process. And if you send a signal, uh, in this case, well, is the seal uh, user one, seek user one to the process, you will get the shell to the, uh, into the process. So in the command line that you have executed the program, you get the router to shell. And then you have a bunch of comments in order to list all the sections. Uh, you can read, write mo memory, you can modify, you can disassemble. I mean, you can do everything from inside the same process. So the program execution will be stopped, but you get a shell. And when you close this shell, so you press quit, the program will continue running. So you can use that as an intern as a in process Excel editor. Uh, I already used some of them before, but maybe not all of you have checked that. But uh, rather to implement a bunch of Unix like uh, Unix commands that are uh, pretty common or useful for uh, writing regression test suites and so on. So there is ls, there is rm, there is cp, etc. So you can use rather to just a standard shell. Another funny thing is that you can use uh, the cursor mode for a uh, visual mode for patching jumps. So if we go into the visual mode.
and just go into there, enable EO catch. And we will modify this jump. So we can go into the cursor mode and we press uh, plus and minus sign. We can increase and decrease the value. So in this case, we are changing the kind of instruction. But if we go into the second byte, we can change the destination. So we can see where the jump is going on. And so on. Now we have the OMFG comment, but there are also another <laughs> bunch of funny comments that, I comment, comments that, that you can run inside Lord 2. There is the what the fuck, lol, et, uh, when, etc. <laughs> you will probably find more if you try. <laughs> there is an issue with a list of other uh, uh, mnemonics that we don't, we don't have yet implemented. Uh, it's also possible to show data statistics, so using the p equal uh, e, we've got the entropy computation of the current section, or the whole binary, depends how you load the binary, and it can count the number of zeros, number of Fs, etc. There is a navigation bar similar to other tools that are uh, allowing you to scroll fast inside the binary. This is using the p uh, dash common. Uh, it's also possible to uh, implement custom visual modes. So if you have into visual mode, you go there, you have a question mark to get all the, common, the key strokes that you can use. But if you press the equal sign, you can change this variable, which is the cmd.b prompt. And this is the vertical prompt. This is something that will show on top of the disassembly. So you can, for example, x at... Uh, So we can scroll around and we get always the X dump in the top side. We can also type pipe. And if we type pipe, we get the, com the column prompt. The column prompt uh, allows you to change something that will be shown at right. So we can put here like maybe the list of registers. So we can create our own layout in visual mode, changing all these kind of options. Uh, it's also possible to have external windows showing different comments. Uh, you can start the web browser using the uh, equal h ampersand. Equal is for uh, comments that are interacting with remote uh, instances of router 2 or starting like an internal GTV server or things like that. And then you can type the ampersand at the end to run this thing in background. So it will, you will keep having the shell of router 2, but there will be a thread in background running the R2 comments that you uh, type in the, uh, in the other session. So you can type this in another session. You will get another router to shell, uh, but abstracting all the comments that are running to the uh, other server. There is, it's also possible to compile uh, X. And X is basically uh, something that it's self-contained and can run anywhere. And this is used for writing payloads for exploits. And you can do that in C uh, using the rack 2 cc uh, uh, common, which is basically uh, calling the C compiler using some specific flags to generate a uh, really table code and, and embedding the syscalls instead of doing uh, libc function calls. So there's a bunch of include files that are modifying the, the way that the compiler will generate code. Uh, and it works with LLVM and, and GCC. But there is also uh, an internal working progress language, which is a bit smaller and allows you to create some more uh, low level things, which is called R. And um, yeah, there is also the debug, debug slow option that allows you to enable more uh, information when you are debugging. When you are debugging, there are some disassemble options that are not shown, uh, mainly because it makes uh, slower the session. Because the, uh, it's producing more read uh, memories in different places, and this produces like a slow process when you are disassembling or scrolling around in the, in the debugger. This adds telescoping to register and stack. You get the backtrace and also enables the seal and extra memory references it reads in the, in the disassembly. So if you are disassembling something and you are not really moving around because you are focused on a specific section, it's always handy to enable this option. And well, there are a bunch of different Fortunes. By default, there are only uh, the standard ones. Uh, there were some people complaining about getting scared like, uh, Rod2 says that it has removed a random file of my home, and <laughs> it doesn't say which files have removed. So it was just a Fortune message. Uh, the thing is that some people get scared about that, and, and some companies don't like to have these kind of messages being shown in their products or things like that. So uh, by default, the default Fortune messages are safe. 
uh, you can disable them, but you can also enable other uh, Fortune messages. And these are all the categories. You can add more just by changing the, adding a new file in there. Well, another thing is that you can write shell codes inside the other two using the rack engine. This is the same thing that the uh, egg thing, uh, how the thing, egg, uh, how the egg thing works. But you can make payloads with this. You can specify, for example, that you want to pay, uh, have ten knobs using the n ten. You can also specify that you want to put this value at the end. But you can specify also that you want to change the third the word with a specific value or a pointer, and this will change the endianness. So as you can see. The one, two, three, four in hexadecimal is uh, in little endian in the final buffer. So that's handy if you want to, if you don't want to use Python for writing payloads because that's the main language that most people use for doing these kind of things. Uh, and it's just one line, and you can also do that from inside Rudder too because you can uh, pipe this command into writex and and write this value inside the buffer that you want to try. Another option that it's not really known by many people is that you can change the output of the screen to be rendered in HTML. If you enable this and you do that, all the color escape codes will be changing by uh, font uh, color uh, tags in HTML. So you can pipe this into a file. And if you open this file, you will get in the browser the, the rendering in with the colors and keeping all the the indentation and so on. This this option is used by the web uh, UIs. And finally, there is air to pipe. But I mean, most of you, I guess, you know what air to pipe is. Uh, but I will make like a quick uh, explanation. It's just uh, the simplest interface for uh, scripting Rodor two. It's just uh, an API of one function, which is CMD. Uh, so you, uh, this function accepts the, the command that you want to run, and you get in, uh, in the result the output of this command. The good thing of this is that it's pretty easy. It's simple to maintain and, and to extend, and it, there is support for so many languages. But not only this, because there are so many ways to interact with Rudder 2. You can use r 2 pipe using a spawn method, so you can spawn an, a new instance of Rudder 2 from the scripting language that you are using, and then it will create a pipe to communicate with the process. Uh, it's also possible to use this through HTTP, through TCP, but also there is the DL open method, which is basically resolving all the methods inside the C implementation of the API in, inside Rudder 2 to call core open. Uh, core CMD uh, a string and then uh, core free, so you can use R to pipe in a way faster way. Uh, let me show you uh, one of these implementations. This one is written in New Lisp. It's pretty uh, easy to read. Uh, and there is, for example, this is the standard uh, spawn method, which is using two environment variables for accessing the the two file descriptors that you need to read and write the read the common and write the output of the common. <coughs> there is also support for JSON output, which is basically calling the other common. And here is the HTTP implementation, the spawn, and finally there is the native implementation. The native implementation is resolving the symbols from these libraries. So loading the library, then resolving the symbol, and then you have the CMD for that, which is calling this C function. This is way faster than, than sending strings to a socket or anything like that, and it works quite well. The only problem of this is that the, if the way that you are calling this or the command that you are running this, it's crashing, uh, it will also crash your program because you are just running everything inside the same memory space. And um, well, one of the two most important implementations are the Python and the JavaScript one. For the JavaScript, uh, there is support for synchronous and asynchronous uh, calls. So you can do like a synchronous uh, execution of R2Pipe and have different commands running in, in, uh, attached to different instances of Ladder 2. And there is also R2Pipe promise, which is used for having like native uh, JavaScript promises for getting the results of the commands. And um, that's it. You have questions? Okay, so let's finish here.